Welcome to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. I'm going to read his bio because it is an impressive bio to say the least, and I want to make sure I get it right before introducing him. Dr. Trevor Hancock is a public health physician, health promotion consultant, consultant, sorry, and retired in 2018 from his role as professor and senior scholar at the School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria. He is also, and this is one of the reasons why we've, we're bringing him on, the first elected leader of the Green Party of Canada. Trevor, Dr. Hancock, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and pleasure to have you on the show to talk about yourself, but also the formation of the Green Party of Canada. Oh, happy to be here. And who doesn't like talking about themselves? <laughs> well, and I'm very happy about that. But I, I, as a uh, former uh, leader of a political party, I'm going to ask the question that I ask all politicians who've ever come on this show, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Trevor? I'm, I'm not sure I can really give an answer to that. I, I'm, what, I'm almost 74 now. It's pretty much always been there. I mean, I can remember um, as, a, as a kid in school, um, I was involved in, in uh, for, I, for example, one of my early experiences was I was badger watching. I grew up in England and we'd go out at night and watch badgers. And one time I went to the reserve and found a couple of badgers had been shot. And so I contacted the local media and they sent a reporter out and we did a story. So in a sense, it began there. Um, when I was not quite 18 years old, um, I went off to Sarawak, in, uh, which is in the northern part of Borneo, one of the states of Malaysia, as a volunteer teacher for a year before I, so I was fresh out of high school, like three months out of high school. And uh, and I did that. Um, I think it was partly a sense of, of um, adventure, uh, partly a sense of, of um, wanting to serve. My father had been in the Navy, I guess that was part of it perhaps. Uh, I, I don't really know. I, it, uh, it just was always part of my life in some way. Getting involved in politics is a uh, uphill battle, and I always find it interesting when my guests come on and talk about their first interaction with politics. You talk about that Badger story, but was there a, was there an election? Was there a, a political issue that got you involved uh, here in Canada or went uh, from where you were from, the United Kingdom, that made politics more intriguing to you, that made you say, maybe this is where I can serve the people of um, the a country I live in? Well, it, it began for me, and ecological politics um, began for me in the early 1970s. So I was a medical student in London, and rather oddly for a medical student, was reading a, a magazine or journal called uh, The Ecologist, uh, which was a fairly radical ecological political mag or ecological magazine that had been started by Teddy Goldsmith and others in about 1969 or 70. And 1972 was the year of the um, first UN conference on the environment in Stockholm. And so as part of their contribution to that, um, and I'll just get that, hopefully it'll stop being blurred, but what I'm holding up is a copy of a book called A Blueprint for Survival. And it was written by the ecologist in 1972, and it was about the uh, the situation in the world. And uh, the front cover that has a quote from the Sunday Times, nightmarishly convincing after reading it, nothing seems quite the same anymore. But in Blueprint for Survival, they talked about the extreme gravity of the local situation today, the potential for breakdown of society and irreversible disruption of life sports systems on the planet, which to me made it a, a health issue. And they went on to say, um, as their third key consideration, it must, it, the, the situation, must now give rise to a national movement to act at a national level and if need be to assume political status and contest the next general election. Wow. So that was 1972. And 
Um, and I read that and I thought, that sounds right. That's what needs to happen. And then not long after, a group of folks began to put together something that they originally called, oddly enough, the People Party. So this is well before the German Greens. And you will recognize the theme that runs through it, a manifesto for survival. That was called a blueprint for survival. So it's the switch from blueprint to manifesto. And it was called the People Party, which later became the Ecology Party and later became the Green Party in Britain. And I ended up as an area organizer for the People Party while I was doing my intern year, my house jobs, as we call them in England, um, Oddly enough, at the Royal Naval Hospital in Hasler, because I was in the Royal Navy. So there I was in the Royal Navy holding meetings of the Hampshire area uh, <laughs> organizing committee of the People Party, <laughs> which sounded very revolutionary um, and is why I left the Navy not long after. Um, so I was I attended the founding convention of the People Party in Britain in 1973 in Coventry, in fact as a delegate. So my involvement in ecological politics goes back over 50 years, uh, right to the very beginnings, the People Party and its equivalent in New Zealand, the Values Party, were the first two ecological political parties in the world, well ahead of the Greens in Germany, who didn't start up till I think the, the late 70s. So, so it, my roots go back there. And then I came to Canada in 1975. And was a family doc in rural New Brunswick and then moved to Toronto and worked in a community health centre. But I was also involved in trying to start, in fact, I wrote a, a, an article which was published in something called uh, Conservative Society Notes uh, in early 1979. And the article was called Tomorrow's Political Party. Where is it? What needs to be done? And, and that and other things and other people uh, led to the creation, ultimately, of the uh, the Green Party. Which I want to dive into a little bit deeper here uh, in a few minutes, but I, I want to follow up with your move to Canada. Uh, so you moved to Canada in uh, 1975, you said. I apologize correctly. Uh, 1975, you moved to Canada. Do you mind me asking what, what, what sparked the move? Was it uh, uh, a job opportunity here in New Brunswick, as you said, as a rural doctor in New Brunswick? Or was it something else that made you move from uh, England to uh, the other common, your, the Commonwealth uh, son and daughter of Canada? Yeah. Well, um. It, it, a lot of it had to do a, a, much in my life, actually, it goes back to my year in Sarawak, which changed my life in so many ways. Um, in fact, I've actually just just yesterday or the day before sent off the final draft of a book about that, which probably uh, we'll wait and see. But the State Library in Sarawak is thinking of publishing because it's, it's all of the letters that I sent home in 1966-67. Um, it, so it's a fascinating kind of naive, slightly bizarre view of Sarawak by a, an 18-year-old City of London kid. Um, it's quite strange, and but I've been back several times. But anyway, um, while I was in Sarawak at this uh, uh, junior high school uh, teaching, um, I worked with uh, QSO and Peace Corps volunteers who I really liked. And so as a medical student, um, every other summer, I came across to North America, twice to Canada, once to the US, but also traveled all over. And this, remember, is what the uh, the uh, late 60s, 68 was my first visit. I think 68, 17 and 72, I was in the US and Canada. Uh, exciting time to be here. And um, I can remember panhandling on the streets of San Francisco in 1970, for example. <laughs> I was lousy, lousy at it. <laughs> Not a good panhandler. Uh, that was that career option closed <laughs> off. Um, but uh, but I, I discovered that uh, I liked the North American kind of more freewheeling, more relaxed way of life and people. Britain, I found very class conscious, very um, uh, racist and sexist. Not that we aren't racist and sexist here. Of course we are. But it, I don't know, it was just it was more was more in your face and in particular the class consciousness part of it. I never quite felt comfortable in the midst of that. My 
on one side, my mother was the daughter of a wealthy City of London Jewish stockbroker, and on the other side, my father was the son of a Salvation Army Yorkshire coal miner. Uh, an improbable mix, and um, um, couldn't have happened if it hadn't been wartime, of course. But um, so, so I never really quite fitted in. I, where would, where, you know, who was I? Where was I? What was I? So I never felt quite comfortable there, and I felt more comfortable, more at home in North America. So that's mainly why we came. And I came with my wife at the time. So moving to Canada, uh, as someone who was involved in the People's Party, and for those who are listening, it's not the People's Party of Canada that he was involved with. It was the uh, catalyst of the uh, potential Green Party uh, national, uh, worldwide, I should say, which was the People's Party in London and the Values Party in other parts of the world. I think uh, uh, Dr. Hancock said New Zealand. New Zealand uh, so yes. Um, but when you move to Canada, there's no Green Party, there's no Environmental Party, there's no People's Party at that time, there's no Values Party. Was politics something that when you first moved here... Oh, uh, we just lost Dr. Hancock's video. Yeah, but what you've got is my alter ego. Yes, I'll see alter, if I can... your alter ego is uh, the Green I'll Face. See can, I'll see if I can get my video to restart. Yeah. Doesn't... Oh look like no worries we will continue on then and hopefully the video will uh come back up here if not then we will continue on like i said but uh dr hancock uh trevor uh when you first moved to canada was there a party that you were interested in or were you not politically engaged when you first moved to canada I wasn't politically engaged. I was being a, busy being a family doctor, a very busy family doctor in rural New Brunswick. Um, but I was starting to look around. And um, and then I moved to Toronto. We moved in 76, I guess. And that's when I... And I worked... Uh, I ended up working for two years in a community health centre in, in Toronto. I wanted to to work on salary. I didn't like the fee-for-service system. And so I um, I guess I just started looking around and thinking about it and obviously writing and contacting people and ended up setting up a small um, email list. And, and then at about the time that I wrote that article in 1979 in Conserva Society Notes, I also... Um, I uh, was involved in something called the Smalk Party, which was a precursor to the Green Party. So it wasn't actually a party. It was a group of a dozen or so candidates who ran in the election in 1980, one of whom, incidentally, was Elizabeth May. So I met Elizabeth May way back then. And um, so there was a slate of a dozen or so candidates who ran in 1980. And that became a precursor as well to the Green Party. And then we started to get more seriously organized after that in the early 1980s. And let's talk about that 1983 uh, leadership, uh, that uh, founding convention in Ottawa of the Green Party of Canada. Um, let's, let's start from your perspective. What was the first steps? Was there, did you start this process? Did someone else approach you about this process? What was the founding notion of the Green Party? Was there an issue that was going on nationally that you believed that needed to be addressed for the Green Party of Canada? Or was it something else? I, my, actually, my recollection of the early days is, is pretty uh vague at this point and and uh because there was a lot happening and i don't remember any particular sequence there was a group of us got together in toronto there was a mailing list of people that i had developed and that others added to across the country um we had folks in saskatchewan folks in quebec folks in bc those in particular i recall and of course elizabeth may who was out in nova scotia at the time but uh, starting law school about then um so building on the uh, the um, so-called small party, um, which incidentally was largely running on an anti-nuclear ticket, um, but based on that um, and on the success of the German Green Party, that became sort of the model. 
Um, and so we started to meet and organize. There was a, um, a Toronto group. There was an Ontario party that we formed. I was the leader of that too for a while. Uh, and, and then we formed, started to form a national party and that was a much bigger job, of course. And this, of course, is all in the days before, really, before, certainly before the internet and email and so on. So it was all done by, um, ha by handwritten or typed letters uh, that were mailed out and it was done by phones called things like that sorry incidentally about the video I, it, it seems to have died on me and i can't get it back no worries no worries there, um, we've we've updated your photo up on there so there's a headshot of yourself on there so your your alternative okay. personality is not there anymore <laughs> so um so we we started to organize and eventually we put together the um the, the convention and we made the decision that in order to be a registered political party in Canada at the time you had to run a minimum of 50 candidates um, and um, there was I don't think there was any requirement for them to be across the country but you just had to run 50 candidates um, and so the big job became could we get 50 candidates which we managed to do uh, and and that uh, that was in 1984. So we ran in 1984, and uh, and that started the whole thing off. So why why put yourself up as leader? I, I want to get to that point because we we can talk about the formation and the values that the Green Party hold, held, but. What was it about the leadership that you wanted to try and tackle? Um, as our, my listeners and my viewers will know, uh, the Green Party is currently going through the leadership race for the Green Party of Canada again in 2022. The next leader will be elected in either October or November, depending on how many ballots they need. This will be 39 years after that June convention in Ottawa, where you were elected leader. So I, I want to go back to where did you decide your best interest interest would be to lead the party what or i shouldn't say what who but why did you believe your best position would be to lead the party or was it another factor of someone asking you to run and you putting that name forward what was it that made you the first leader of the green party of canada well i think it was really that i had been um fairly central to the organizing of things right from the get-go i'm by nature an organizer and uh, and the starter of things. I mean, my history is that I start things so and and, and then I move on. So I, I've also co-founded, for example, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment about 30 years ago. And about 20 years ago, I co-founded the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. So my, my tendency is to be a, a starter and an organizer um, and I'm fairly methodical about that. I think also the fact that I have been involved in ecological politics in Britain a decade before, really no one else had been thinking about ecological politics in, that was in our group as long as I had or as much as I had. And so uh, that became, it, it, I'm not sure it was anything I particularly thought I, it, it wasn't a position of power, that's for sure, uh, not in that party. Um, but uh, it was it was more osmosis than anything else. It just seemed like a natural thing to to happen. Was it a, a contestant that's nomination? Because I've, I've tried to do my research and I, I can't find if it was an actual contestant nomination or were you acclaimed as the first leader or well, what happened on that faithful day in June in that hotel room in uh, Ottawa? I think we probably had a slate, but to be honest, I, I don't recall much of that any longer. And it was 39 what, years ago is quite a long time ago. No, no, understandable. But you you run in the 1984 general, a federal general election, which is the election yep. that Brian Mulroney is swept into power with one of the largest mandates. You, you, the Green Party under your leadership runs 60 candidates. You said you wanted to get 50 because that was the requirement by Elections Canada, but you got 60. 
what what were your what were your hopes for that election? Was it to start a dialogue about uh, ecological uh, or ecological uh, politics? Was it about a certain issue that you wanted to address and just bring to the forefront, or was it just to have that option for Canadians to give uh, a vote to a a green party where the environment was a issue going back to that manifesto that you held up earlier in the interview, going back to that option that Canadians would be able to have. I think it's the, the green politics is, is very different from other parties and that that voice was not being heard. Uh, the core elements of our of our platform and, and philosophy had to do with obviously um, ecological issues and the planet, but also with social de- justice, with uh, democratic reform and with peace. Um, and so those are the big four strands. And on... What do you mean by green politics is different though? Well, it's, it's different because first of all, it puts the planet uh, pretty much at the center of our thinking and says, how do we have a society and communities that can live within the limits of the planet? And there was one of the more famous books that came out of that 1972 first UN conference on the environment was the Club of Rome's report, The Limits to Growth. Um, And so we were a party that didn't believe in economic growth in the conventional sense. In fact, we saw economic growth as the problem, not the solution. Whereas most of the other parties, uh, whether they're left or right, I always used to say that the planet doesn't really care whether you're a a capitalist or a communist. Uh, You're both trying to grow and and, and exploit and extract and uh, pollute. And what your ideology is politically makes no difference. Uh, So we were very different in that sense. Um, I think we were very different in then trying to craft. One of the issues that I think is still a a challenge for green parties everywhere is we're not a one issue party, except to the extent that the one issue is that we only have one, one earth, which incidentally was the title of another book out of the 1972 conference, Only One Earth by Margaret Ward and René Dubois, but um, there's only one Earth. And so if there's only one Earth, what does that mean for the kind of society you can have? And it affects all policies. It affects education policy, housing policy, transportation policy, agricultural policy, you name it. Uh, There are no policies that aren't affected by that philosophy. And they're all very different. So it's not... it's not a one issue party in the sense that it's not just about environmental protection. What it's actually about is how do you craft a society that can uh, create a good life for everybody within the limits of one planet? And what does that look like? And, and it means some major shifts in core values, in thinking, in philosophy. Uh, we used to talk a lot about paradigm shifts back then. So how, how do we fix that, though? Because we are, like I said, we're in the midst of a leadership election and um, the elections that I've covered in my time since the 1990 Ontario election, uh, I have seen the Green Party run candidates and when you talk to people at the door and you talk to candidates, uh, they say their biggest challenge, like you said, is overcoming that uh the mentality that of Canadians having that the Green Party is a one issue party. All they care about is the environment and that's it. They're not running as a serious uh, option. They're just running on a green uh, environmental friendly platform. So how do we change that? How does the next leader of the Green Party, how does this iteration of the Green Party uh, change the attitudes and the mindset of Canadians to stop getting them to think about the Greens as a one-issue party, but a a party that is based on real substantial uh, policies that, yes, take into consideration the environment and the one earth, but also taking consideration inflation and uh, transportation. So how do how do we do that? And I know that's a the million dollar question that a lot of Greens are asking themselves right now. But you're the first leader, so I'm going to ask you point blank: How do we do it? 
I think part of it is we have to frame all our policies in terms of their relationship to that central question of how do you create a society that can live within the constraints of one earth that um, we're all in it together I I, I was um, I wrote a piece a year or so ago um, that was published I think in the Toronto Star um, suggesting that a, a, a suitable platform would be something the UN Secretary General said um, he said about a couple of years ago now that humanity is at war with nature, that this is suicidal, and that we have to make peace with nature. So how would you frame a society as one that on the one hand makes peace with nature, and on the other hand does so in a way that creates a good quality of life for everyone? And part of that is for everyone is very important. Uh, so it has to be equitable. We're all in this together, all meaning all of us in Canada, but also all of us in our community and all of us in the world. Um, it's a very different approach that requires, as much as anything, a shift in core values and, uh, and philosophy. So core values such as a very simple one is we measure progress in terms of GDP. Well, GDP is a really stupid way to measure progress. Um, Why? For a lot of reasons. Why? Yeah. Um, if you really want to, in one of the ways to increase GDP, encourage smoking. Because you'll sell a lot of tobacco and you'll spend a lot of money fixing people who are sick from using tobacco. Both of those add to GDP. Um, or sink an oil tanker and spend $100 million cleaning up the mess. That adds to GDP have a war that adds to GDP there's a lot GDP doesn't make any distinction between good economic activity and bad economic activity it just lumps it all together so you can you can make progress seemingly and there's there's interesting indi alternative indicators such as the uh, genuine progress indicator and when you chart that what you see is GDP keeps going up and the GPI, which adjusts for all those things I talked about and other things, really doesn't go up. It's pretty much flatlined since the 1970s in the US, may even be going down now. So we need to think about that. We need to think about the whole idea of growth. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I always for some reason forget the, uh, the guy who said it, but back in 1973, Kenneth Boulding. Kenneth Boulding, who was a former president of the uh, American, the AAAS, American Association of the Advancement of Science, and also the American Society of Economists, or whatever it's called. He said to the Senate, in, at a Senate hearing, anyone who believes you can have indefinite growth within a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. Uh, we've got these sort of myths about endless growth, about GDP being good for us, um, that that poison our whole approach to society, to the economy, to the planet, to each other, for that matter. So what should we be basing it on? What should we actually, because uh, politicians of all stripes will say the GDP is the most important thing that we have to look at, because as you said, it dictates how well we're doing our economic growth in the country or inflation or recession. So what should we be looking at? What, is there a line item that we should be looking at is there a moment that we should be looking at because everything comes to, down to numbers in, in in this government it seems like the federal government i should say and sometimes provincial governments so what line item should we be looking at to say okay we're doing better than we were or we sh we are doing worse than we were two things um human well-being and the state of the planet um it's as simple as that those are the two things that matter. And part of our problem is we've put the economy at the center um, and that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, there's a, a wonderful quote I use from the Worldwide Fund for Nature from about a decade ago um, that said that environment, environments sustain societies that create economies. It doesn't work the other way around. And yet we act as though it did. So we need to displace, for example, why is the Minister of Finance the second most important minister in the government after the Premier or the Prime Minister? 
Uh, why is the budget the thing we pay most attention to? Why do we pay attention to GDP? Because we put the economy at the center of our thinking, we have the wrong focus as a society. We're focused on the wrong outcome. The right outcome is what is this doing for human well-being expressed equitably so it's got to deal with issues of social justice and what is it doing to the state of the planet so if you grow your economy by harming human well-being or harming the planet how is that better for us and yet that's what we do time and time and time again so and even go oh so i apologize for interrupting there go ahead so trying to trying to fight climate change you know so my my public health perspective, my ecology perspective is very simple. You put people's well-being at the centre. You put the well the well-being, if you like, of the planet at the centre. And we need to talk about some really what amount to core spiritual values or certainly core values about what matters, what counts. So what portfolio would you be looking at? Is it environment? I know that's the uh, ass assumption that some people might have who might be listening to this. Would would the environment would be would it be social development? What it, what Paul, what uh, cabinet portfolio would be the second highest in uh, if the Greens or yourself would ever have been become prime minister? Uh, I think a combination of human well-being and planetary well-being and you have to sort of look at the two together you can't separate them you can't harm you you can't build human well-being by harming the planet because ultimately that harms human well-being and you can't protect the planet at all, at all costs if those costs are also going to harm human well-being so how do you balance those so it's the balance between human well-being and planetary well-being and so that's what i put at the center i'm actually there's a, a group so what this year world health day in um back in april uh the theme was our planet our health um and a group of organizations and people got together um with uh, canadian association of physicians of the environment canadian coalition for green health care doctors for planetary health a bunch of other groups and organizations and we created an open letter to the to the first ministers talking about what does it mean to take our planet our health seriously uh in the end it was uh the letter was co-signed by about 35 major organizations including the canadian medical association the canadian nurses association and others and what we uh, recommended were things such as creating a human uh, a, a societal well-being um, secretariat within the Privy Council office or within the cabinet office provincially uh, to guide these kind of discussions to make that the centerpiece of the cabinet's work we've recommended creating a well-being budget which a number of countries uh, have started to do such as uh, Aotearoa New Zealand has done that uh, Finland is involved with as is Scotland and Iceland and Wales with a, an initiative called uh, well-being economy governments um, so we need a well-being budget and the federal government has started to do a quality of life framework that's the basis of that but they need to go whole hog into it and we recommended um, following an example from Wales, establishing a um, or creating a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and a commissioner for the Wellbeing of Future Generations, whose job it is to report on government progress in meeting sustainable development and health type goals. So you have to change the focus of government. You have to change what's at the center of our thinking. And then you have to create an economy that meets those needs. You don't create a society to serve an economy. You have to create an economy to serve a society. You, you and we've got it as back. <laughs> you, you mentioned the buzzwords that I want to talk about for two seconds here, and that's climate change. Um, yep. There is a population, there is a portion of this population in the province, in the country of Canada, and I would say even around the world that says climate change isn't real. It's not happening. It's something that is make believe. Everyone seems to be pushing off the idea of, and this is not me saying this. I believe climate change. I believe it's man made. I believe it is happening. We can look outside every single day and see what's happening. Even in Jasper National Park right now, it is burning to the ground and it is happening as we speak. Um, 
going back to that first election in 1983 and now looking to 2022, has this issue divided more Canadians than a lot of other issues that you've seen in your time uh, watching politics, following politics, following the green movement of Canada? Because when I talk to uh, Albertans, <clears throat> And I, the only reason I say Albertans is because I live here. There is a very big divide on the issue. It's not real. It is real. And until I think we get to the idea that everyone, there is a consensus that everyone knows that climate change is real, um, we're not going to be able to address it fully. Do you agree with that statement or am I up to lunch by saying that until every, until the consensus of Canadians or even the world agrees, we're fighting an uphill battle? Well, we're certainly fighting an uphill battle, but we're fighting it because the the whole system is tilted in favor of the fossil fuel industries who spend a lot of money getting their message out. Um, they've been, and I, I think of them in terms of the tobacco industry. I was very involved in the 1980s in fighting the tobacco industry. The fossil fuel industry is using the same playbook, create confusion about the science, um, talk about people's right to smoke or their right to use fossil fuels, um, you know, obfuscate, lobby like crazy, um, which they do. Um, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, field is tilted. On top of that, you've got huge fossil fuel subsidies still being paid um, to, to support the industry. Why isn't every single penny of that being taken away from the fossil fuel industry right now and given to the clean and renewable energy and the conservation industries because that's what we need but you know you it's, it's the old thing you'll you can say some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time but you're not going to get everyone but to sit, part of the the myth i think is that we're divided as if it, we were divided like 51 49 half the population can't do that's not true the vast majority of the population understand that climate change is real. You're always going to have deniers, just like you're going to have deniers around vaccines and other things. You know, I mean, I don't think we can afford to cater to the crazies, frankly. We have to be responsible for the rest of the population and also for future generations. This is something that um, is going to affect future generations. It's not us, certainly not people my age, who are going to end up paying the price for this. I'll be gone before most of the severe, really severe effects. It's although it's beginning to happen so rapidly, that may not be the case. Do you think we've done enough? Do you think Canada has done enough for its side of this uh, to fight climate change? Uh, we hear, and I, I say we hear because I know that there is a larger vocal minority that seems to always uh, take up a lot more oxygen than the quiet majority. But do you believe that Canada has done enough? And what would you recommend to Environment Minister Gilbo, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, or even the premiers, the first na uh, first pre uh, first uh, ministers of this country, to say, this is this is step one. This is step one. Tomorrow morning, if you did this, it would put us on a better path than we are right now with fighting this issue of uh, helping the environment, but also helping uh, Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Well, first off, we're certainly not doing enough. In fact, we're one of the worst performers in the OECD when it comes to commitments on climate change and actually meeting targets. We're not doing it. Um, and uh, there's a there's a guy who does columns for the Canada's National Observer called Barry Saxifrage, worth looking at his materials, but uh, he puts out a column every month or so, but full of data and, and you know, we're not beginning to, um, reach our targets where we still support the fossil fuel industry first thing i do as i just said is stop all fossil fuel subsidies withdraw them all and transfer them um, maybe not exactly overnight but within the space of a year or two allowed a little bit of, of time for a just transition because uh, the transition has to be just but switch it all to other forms of energy uh, stop investing in fossil fuels the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has been very strong on the whole climate change brief. And he said not so long ago that continued investment in fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. And I agree with him. So you've got to stop investing in it. You can't, it's like saying we're going to stop smoking, but let's subsidize the tobacco industry and keep growing tobacco. 
So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you here, Trevor, for two seconds, if you're okay with that, because I want to get your sure. your reaction to this, because this this is an interesting conversation. And I, I love these types of conversations. The the conservative that has just listened to the show has just heard you say we need to stop subsidizing the uh, 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 natural the uh, oil and gas industry is about to uh, like blow a gasket because they're going to hear you want to close up shop. You want to stop production of all oil and the bitumen coming out of this world, out of this province of Alberta and lo- and close about hundreds of thousands of jobs in Alberta. You're not saying that, are you? You're just saying you need to end the subsidies that the provinces and the Canadian government gives to these oil and gas industries to do their work. You're not saying close up the entire oil industry tomorrow, are you? I'm not saying that. I am saying stop the subsidies. I think the oil industry is an, is a kind of like the uh, the steam-powered industry. It's an industry that's had its day and we have to move on. Um, that's a painful transition, and that's why you have to have a just transition act and a process in place for that. But you know, it's like uh, the, you know, we do, we don't have horses on the street any longer. We don't have buggy whip manufacturers. Um, those things are gone. This needs to be gone. If we were to extract and use all of the fossil fuel reserves we have, we'd be hitting six, seven degrees centigrade or more of global warming never mind the one or two that we're struggling to achieve. So part of the answer is a large chunk of the known reserves are going to have to stay in the ground. And if they're going to to stay in the ground, then the sooner we start the transition, the better. You can't keep putting off. You can't keep arguing, well, if we stop, someone else will keep doing it, so we need to keep doing it. Someone has to move first. I see no reason why we should wait for others to move first. That is a, I was about to jump into that for a second, because the one thing you hear over and over again is, well, China is the worst exporter of carbon dioxide in this world. Um, We're trying to do as much as we can, but while other countries are polluting still, we aren't doing, uh, we are doing our part and we're actually harming our industries and we're harming our workers. Um, Is that a fair or even uh credible uh, counter argument to um, uh, trying to solve the climate crisis issue in this country because people will like you said will say well the americans are still our uh, usa is still prom- uh, pumping out oil and gas china is still doing it they're burning coal on an exponential basis germany is importing oil and gas and coal uh, they're restarting some of their nuclear industries as well because of the upcoming uh the issue that's going on with Ukraine and Russia has stopped the flow of some uh, natural resources into power their uh, hydro and their heat for the winter coming months. Is that just not a credible argument anymore? And we have to say, like you said, if not us, then who's going to do it? So one of us needs to step up and say, yes, let's go forward and let's try and solve this. And it's going to hurt, but it's not going to, it's going to be a beneficial for the long run. Well, that's exactly what we have to do. And it, 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 it's not going to be a painless transition, obviously. But, uh, but and we wouldn't be alone. We have to get together with other countries that are leaders. You know, Who is a leader? Who like- is a leader right now, in your opinion, on this file? Is there a country that you look to and go, you know what, they're doing it right? Well, for years, I used to say, why can't we be Sweden? Um, these days, I think I'd probably say, why can't we be Finland or perhaps uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, or, or perhaps Wales? Um, the, the point is that if we don't change, then the problems we're seeing right now are going to get a whole lot worse. And what's really troubling, there's a lot of talk at the moment about what's being called a poly crisis. I just wrote, I write a weekly column for the local newspaper out here, the Times Colonist, and I just wrote a column about the the poly crisis. So there's multiple crises happening at the same time and interacting. So it's not as if climate change was our only problem. We also have biodiversity loss. We also have pollution. We are crossing planetary boundaries on ocean acidification, on nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, We're destroying tropical forests. Uh, and we, now we're going to go after the boreal forest as well. Um, so all of these 
crises are interacting with each other and then interacting with social and political and economic crises. And all of those start to get more and more severe and, and reinforce each other as they go along. So we're facing an existential threat, maybe not in the next five or 10 years, but certainly before the end of this century. So children born today, remember, will still be alive in 78 years time, most of them. Um, they're going to be living through this. So we're not even talking about really future generations. We're talking about current people alive today who are going to have to live through this. And we need to take some steps to stop that. And we're all going to have to do this. And it doesn't even extend just to oil. We're going to have to change our, our agricultural system. It's another hit, I suppose, for Alberta, if you like. But the, the, the beef industry is, a, is another problem. And you have to switch away from beef industry that generates a lot of methane and a lot of um, uh, other environmental impacts. And generally, we have to shift, I would argue, to a low meat diet and a, and a, low, and a low meat diet that has a lower ecological footprint. So that means much more uh, chicken and eggs and pork and things if we're going to eat meat and, and not beef um, in particular. Um, and again, one of the things to think about in all of this is not that this is a terrible thing that's going to destroy our industries, but what are the opportunities for the new industry? So when I talk to young people, which I do from time to time, what I talk about is, look, we're going to have, we're going to, have to change so many things, and you're going to have to be involved in changing so many things, that this is a huge opportunity, actually. That's one way to look at it. We have an opportunity not to defend the 19th and 20th century industries, but to create the 21st and 22nd century industries and businesses and economies. And we're going to have to do that across an entire range of things. It means new laws, new business models, new spiritual and, and faith values, new cultural values, and all of that has to be reinvented. So it is in many ways an, an extraordinary opportunity as well as an extraordinary challenge. Um, we're coming up at the 45 minute mark and I want to uh, turn pivot for a second here because we could probably talk about the climate crisis and the ish how we can uh, start rectifying the issues that we've caused over the last decades, uh, two decades, almost all of the time that in the industrial revolution, since the industrial revolution. But I want to turn to Green Party politics for a second. Um, I, I got to ask this question right off the bat because I didn't ask it at the beginning. Are you still involved with the Green Party of Canada? Are you still following what's going on, who the leaders are? Are you canvassing, helping out during elections? Mm, not to any great extent. Um, and, and that's, I, I, I left the Green Party in about 1986 and um, I, I've, uh, you know, I, I can remember the, the time when it started to happen. One of the problems, of course, of being involved in any new organization and being the quote unquote leader, first of all, it was the leader of a party that wasn't sure it wanted to be a party uh, or should it just be a social movement. And then it was a party that wasn't sure it wanted to have a leader, should it have as being proposed now a co-leadership or whatever. Now you had to have a leader because that was the rules under the Election Act in order to become a political party. Someone had to be listed as leader. Um, but it meant that I was often at the center of the swirl of all of the bother and upset around those kind of issues. And, and it just became unproductive. And I've never forgotten I was in a meeting one day when all of this was churning and going on and a little light went on in my head and it said, you don't have to be here, you know. And this was at a time when I was, I was a, an associate minister of health for the city of Toronto. I had a, a burgeoning career in public health. I had been involved in starting um, what was becoming, or just starting a, a, what became a global movement called Healthy Cities and Healthy Communities, which is actually one of my more important contributions. And so I decided, no, I didn't have to be there anymore. And it was time to go. And that's partly my pattern. Um, when I go, I go. Um, and I don't look back and I don't go back. Um, I go on to the next thing and I start something else. Um, and I, I leave it to others to follow on behind. I've had a couple of opportunities in my life to rewrite constitutions for organizations. Both times I've abolished the position of past president. 
and created the position of president-elect. I don't believe in the past leadership sort of hanging around and looking over people's shoulders and saying, oh, you should have done it this way. You know, when you're done, you're done, move on. And so that's what I did. And I've had many other ways. I mean, a lot of the work I do around healthy cities and I've been doing for 40 years or so, 35 years or so, uh, is really green politics with a a small G and a small P. Uh, But it's still the same values and principles that drive it. Um, So I think you contribute in other ways. I tried the political route and I learned that it wasn't really for me. And so now, I I mean, I still know Elizabeth May. I count her as a friend. We talk occasionally. I have uh, other friends who've been involved in green politics. But, you know, I'm, I'm... I, I'm outside of it. While I've you've, moved on. While you've moved on, and you might be outside of it, um, I want to pose this question to the first leader of the Green Party of Canada and the first leader of the Green Party of Ontario. Yeah, the Ontario Green Party, or uh, Green Party yeah. of Ontario. Um, the Greens have changed. The Greens are uh, in power. Uh, they are elected officials in BC. They're elected officials. They're official opposition in PEI. They have representation in the legislature in New Brunswick and in Ontario with Mike Schreiner, the Green Party leader. Um, does this does this give you hope that one day we might see um, a or in, even in the House of Commons, we have two uh, MPs who are green, I should say. Does this give you hope that Canada is turning a page and taking the green crisis of green politics with a small G, small P, uh, serious, and people are actually stepping up and saying, you know what, it's time. If not now, when? If not who? If not me, who? So do, do you have hope that uh, Canada is turning a page and is actually taking this crisis that we're in serious now? Well, I always have hope. Um, And in this case, I also think you should look at what happens locally in municipal politics. And and part of it, we always talked about, because so many of the policies that we need are actually within municipal control uh, to some extent. So uh, transportation and housing and to some extent energy use and a whole and certainly land use a whole lot of areas of important work um, municipally and and there's a lot of green often small g green ca- municipal councillors elected i know in our own municipality i'd say two or three of our councillors are greens one of them is a is a formally a green the others are philosophically greens uh, so I think that's that's happening. Um, I also think one of the things that we used to talk about when we first started was that what we wanted was to get green ideas into the political process. And I think somewhat naively at the time, we said, you know, if other parties want to take our policies and run on them and implement them, that's fine. We're fine with that. We want to get the policies implemented. We want to get the changes done. We don't really mind who does it. We don't have to be empowered to do it. Now, I actually think we do need to be empowered to do it because I don't. I think 50, 40 years has shown us the other parties are not about to do it, um, are still wedded to the old model. Um, but the biggest challenge, which was another important part of green politics, is the lack of, of um, proportional representation. So the Green Party would do a lot better with proportional representation. There's a lot of people who I think would like to vote green, but don't vote green because they see it as throwing away a vote, quote unquote. Um, and and that's because in our, proportion, in our current system um, with first past the post, um, all of the votes that are not for the candidate are kind of wasted, um, for the winner rather. So I, I definitely think we need to move to some form of proportion representation and that's another piece of it but i also think uh, the, the the ngo i've started here called conversations for a one planet region which is very much focused on the greater victoria region um it's called conversations part of what we have to do is we have to talk about this we, we, we until recently we weren't even talking about climate change we certainly as a society are not talking about the wider issue of global ecological change, nor are we talking about how you create a, a well-being society. So 
that's what we have to start with. We have to start the conversations, and I think the conversations start locally, one household at a time, one block at a time, one neighborhood at a time, and that's what we need is to build that up. And that's where the show has come into play a little bit is we're, we're hoping to start these conversations, right? Because at the end of the day, yes. in, in today's society of social media and Twitter, it seems like we like to yell into the void of uh, Twitter and just hope to get our point across and it doesn't do anything, anyone good uh, to do that. And actually, if you sit down with somebody, you might actually learn something or two about people and about an issue that you didn't think about or a side that you or a, a position that you didn't think of. And sometimes that's better for our democracy. So I agree wholeheartedly. But I want Yeah, and I, I think ahead. that's so important. And I just want to commend you for what you're doing because that the conversation is important and we need conversation at all levels and the more the merrier. Well, I appreciate that. I want to turn to one last thing and then we'll wrap up here, uh, Trevor, and that is what's life like after retirement? You've retired in 2018 and uh, now you are... Uh, uh, you're still uh, working. Well, not still working, but you're still uh, volunteering for your work uh, on your NGO. What's life been like since retirement from the, uh, I want to make sure I get the name of the school correct here. So I'm just going to pull it up again. Uh, the uh, senior scholar at the School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria. So how's retirement? <laughs> what retirement? <laughs> <laughs> So you're not doing. I, you're still. You're still working away, aren't you? That, I, that, I've heard versions of that call it refirement or rewirement. Um, I'm. I'm working as hard as ever. Um, I'm just paid in a different way. I'm paid through my pensions, but I'm still earning an income, or getting an income. Uh, whether I'm earning it's another matter, but I'm getting it. But uh, the beauty is I don't have to be on committees. I don't want to be on and do work I don't want to do. I, just, I can please myself. But no, I'm very involved. I'm on a global working group on plan free health. I'm on a, uh, through the International Union of Health Promotion and Education. Uh, I'm involved with this new national working group on uh, plan free health and a well-being society. Um, so building on that letter we sent to the first ministers back in April, we're now sort of looking at creating a, or we've created a working group to move that agenda forward. Um, I'm involved uh, with the Public Health Association. Uh, we're putting on a conference here in BC on plan free health in a couple of months time. I'm co-chairing that. Um, I'm involved in the local one. I'm involved in a group called Doctors for Planetary Health, which is a uh, um, so, sort of somewhat based on the Extinction Rebellion model, but not quite as rebellious as the rebellion um being doctors um so yeah i'm very engaged in all sorts of ways plus i'm a morris dancer uh, my face that you saw earlier my alter ego um uh, i'm a green man i form in the uh, mama's play i'm a morris dancer i dance twice a week um i walk the dog i i'm busy as hell and i'm having a blast well, and it sounds like you are. It sounds like you're enjoying re uh, quote unquote retirement as much as one can do. But it seems like you're still being active, which is always great. Um, I, I know I said that was the last question, but I'm, I'm going to leave on this, uh, Trevor. And that is how because you seem like someone who is willing to have a conversation or answer questions from a range of people. And if you do or don't, then that's great. But how can people learn more about yourself? How can people follow your writing? How can people uh, read some of the articles that you write in your local newspaper there? Is there a website that people can find you at? Yeah, sure. It's uh, trevorhancock.com. And um, it's a blog site. And I post my weekly columns there. And I've been doing that. I've been writing the column now for almost eight years. Uh, every week so I've got about and I think I only started posting them about three or four years in but there's two or three hundred columns there covering a range of topics having to do with population and public health um, there's also a list of my publications there and, and a list of my videos and presentations so there's a whole bunch of stuff on that website and for those who are listening and following along um, 
the link to Trevor's website is in the show notes. So highly recommend you check it out. I, I perused it for a bit before our interview this morning, and I appreciate everything that you've written about because I, I, I found myself being engaged more than I've ever been on a website or when reading someone's el- someone else's article. So thank you for everything you do, and I look forward to continuously reading them for days to come or years to come. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Mr. D- Dr. Hancock, Trevor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we are at the hour mark. I know I said 30 to 40 minutes, but the time flew by and I just can't believe that we covered so much, but we barely scratched the surface. And I thank you so much for taking time out of your day and doing this with me today. Uh, it's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm sorry about the video feed because I actually like seeing and being seen, but, uh, it- shit happens <laughs> <laughs> it certainly does so with that i want to thank everyone for tuning in via the website and via youtube have yourself an excellent day and as i say every exit of every interview get out from behind social media put down that phone for at least five to ten minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody it helps our society it helps our democracy and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.